If you want to do something well, you have to do one thing at a time. We live in a society of multitasking, people doing three, four, five things all at once, and claiming they can do them just as well. But that's like asking a person with brain injury how their brain is. As far as they're concerned, their brain is functioning perfectly fine. But because the brain has its limitations when it's been injured like that, it can't really be a good judge. And so when you ask people who are multitasking if they're doing their jobs well, you're asking people who can't really judge well. To judge if something is done well, you have to watch it from the very beginning to the very end with your undivided attention. So as we're sitting here right now, let this talk be in the background. It's here to serve as a fence. So when your attention leaves the breath, you run into the talk, and the talk is there to remind you, go back to the breath. It's also here to give you some ideas of what to do. We're not simply here watching whatever happens with the breath. When the Buddha gave breath meditation instructions, he said that you train yourself. In other words, you learn how to breathe in certain ways. In the beginning, you simply learn how to discern what are the distinctions between long breathing and short breathing. And the John Lee would add, fast, slow, heavy, light, deep, shallow, or in, long, out, short, in, short, out, long, to get a sense of what the breath can do for the body. And when you have a sense of what kind of breathing feels good, that helps you with one of the steps, breathing in and out, sensitive to rapture, breathe in and out, sensitive to pleasure. The rapture and pleasure don't happen on their own. You have to give rise to them. And you do that by the way you breathe, and also by the way you perceive the breath. When you breathe in, what's the image you have? Some people talk of the breath as if it were a tactile sensation. In other words, simply the touch of the air moving through the nose, over the lip. But the Buddha doesn't talk about it in those terms. He talks about it as one of the properties of the body itself, the breath energy inside the body. It originates in the body. And it's because of the breath energy in the body that the air can flow in and out to begin with. So it's this energy you want to focus on. So that leads to the next step, to breathe in and out, sensitive to the whole body. Think of the whole body breathing, from the top of the head down to the tips of the toes, from the front to the back, the back into the front. Think of the whole body breathing together. And then look at what the mind needs. Does the mind need to be energized? Okay, breathe in a way that gives you more energy. Does it need to be calmed down? Okay, breathe in a way that's more relaxing. You're taking care of three things here all at once. Breath, feelings, and the mind. You want to bring them together, so they form a good whole. Breath filling the body, a feeling of pleasure filling the body, your awareness filling the body. And you don't have to pay attention to anything else right now. The sound of the plane going overhead, just let it go right through. It's really none of your business right now. Your business is to get to know your mind, to get to know your breath. You want to know the breath because it's your anchor. And it's also a mirror for the mind. 
Because ultimately, this is what the meditation comes down to. We're focusing in on the mind. As the Buddha said, it's the mind that creates the problem of suffering to begin with. You can think of all the things in the world that you might be suffering from, what other people have done, what other people have said. But the Buddha says that's not the real cause of suffering. The real cause lies inside. Even before we see sights, hear sounds, smell aromas, taste flavors, touch tactile sensations of the body, there's activity going on in the mind. And if we're ignorant about that activity, then no matter what we see or hear, it's going to lead to suffering. If we know what we're doing as we come to these things, then it all becomes part of the path. The Buddha focuses attention on two things. One he calls fabrication, sankara, and intention, chetana. And these things come first, and yet we don't realize it, which is why we suffer. So as we come to meditate, we're trying to get more alert to these activities in the mind. Like if you really want to know your intentions, you set one intention up and say, I'm going to stay right here. And then all of a sudden you see other intentions coming in, which you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. You just would have gone along, drifting along with them. It's like a boat in a river. Different currents come from the left, different currents come from the right. And you're not really aware of them because you simply follow them. Whichever one is strongest, you go with it. But here you're trying to set up one intention and make it yours. As for any other intention that comes in right now, Tell yourself, that's not yours. And to get to no fabrication, the Buddha says, know that there are three kinds. The in and out breathing is a kind of fabrication to begin with, because it's influenced by your intentions. And there's what he calls directed thought and evaluation, vitaka, vichara. It's how you talk to yourself. So here with the breath, talk to yourself in a way that's encouraging, that helps you to stay. And finally, there are perceptions and feelings. Okay, you're trying to create a feeling of ease. And you hold in mind whatever picture of the breath in the body is helpful for getting you to settle down. You can think of the body as being like a big sponge. As you breathe in, the breath can come in from all directions, every pore of the skin. Or you can remind yourself that even though the air may be coming in through the nose, the breath originates in the body. So where in the body does the breath energy start? Is it down around the navel, in the middle of the chest? in the middle of the head. Where, when you focus on it, does it seem the breath is coming from there? And it's allowed to spread and feel good. Or you can think of every cell in the body breathing. They all have equal weight. You give them all the same amount of attention. You don't spotlight some and throw others into the dark. You try to be aware of every cell in the body, breathing in, breathing out, everybody together, and see if that perception is calming, because you're trying to calm the mind, calm the breath, but have energy at the same time, be alert at the same time. And then use the breath to bring things into balance. Sometimes the mind is wilted lacking energy. What kind of breathing would give you more energy? Sometimes it's too frenetic, jumping around here and there. What kind of breathing would calm it down? 
what kind of perceptions would calm it down. As you explore these issues, you begin to realize that there are a lot of interesting potentials here. You see how the state of the mind depends on the breathing, and how the breathing depends on the state of the mind. Again, it bring, everything gets brought back to the mind. But simply it's a matter of learning how to use the acts of the mind and the results of those acts to train the mind higher and higher. And it goes to show that even this one thing, the breath, as you focus on it, has lots of implications, lots of lessons to teach. It's simply a matter of learning how to look at it the right way, ask the right questions. There was once a senior monk from Bangkok who came to see a John Munn in the forest. And this was someone who had a tendency to look down on the forest monks, thinking, what do these forest monks know? They, they don't get to hear Dharma talks every day like I do. They haven't studied the books like I do. So I said to a John Munn, when I'm in Bangkok, even though there are many wise people all around the city, still many times I run into problems in, in the Dharma that I can't solve. can't solve for myself, they can't solve them for me. What do you do out here in the forest? Where do you go to listen to the Dharma? And John Mun's response was, I hear the Dharma seven days a week, 24 hours a day, except when I'm asleep. A leaf falls from a tree, and it teaches inconstancy. The crows call. It's because of stress, because of suffering. The senior monk was taken aback. And he said, well, it shows that you know how to listen. So how do you listen? You keep the Buddhist teachings on the Four Noble Truths in mind. What is the stress? The stress is in the clinging. Where does it come from? It comes from our own craving. Can that craving be stopped? Yes. How do you do it? Through the Eightfold Path. That's the framework you bring. I mean, you can listen to crows cawing from other points of view, from other perspectives, and you'll get different lessons. But if you're looking for the stress in things, looking for reasons to let go of your attachments, then you hear them in a different way. And you realize you can't simply just Tell yourself, let go. You have to let go through understanding, which is why we focus on one thing at a time. Focus on the breath. And the issues of feelings and issues of the mind will gather right there. We can see them all together clearly. They all become one big issue. And you realize that the solution to that issue is in the mind. So that's where these lessons keep pointing us. What is your mind doing right now? Is it skillful? Is it leading to suffering, or is it leading to the end of suffering? If it's leading to suffering, what can you change? If you listen for answers to those questions, you're going to hear them. Because as all the Ajahn say, everything is teaching us. The simple question is, are we willing to learn the lessons? Or do we have other lessons in mind? The more you get to know your breath, the more you get to know your mind. The more you begin to see that the Buddha was right. The big issue in life is the suffering we're causing ourselves, and it's unnecessary. 
and we can put it into it. And where do you look to learn that lesson? You look right here. <laughs>